Washington studios to discuss his new book, Serbs and Croats, The Struggle in Yugoslavia. That's Sunday on C-SPAN, the companion network of C-SPAN 2, beginning at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Next, we take you to the campus of the American University here in Washington, D.C., for a forum which is titled Malcolm X the Movie, Cinema as History. Taking part in Monday night's program were Juan Williams of the Washington Post, National Public Radio film critic Pat Dowell, Richmond Free Press columnist Peter Bailey, and Jackie Jones, the editor of the Black Film Review. Malcolm X cast member Al Freeman Jr. also took part in the panel discussion. You may recall in the movie, Mr. Freeman played the black Muslim leader Elijah Muhammad. Mr. Freeman is currently the chairman and artistic director of Howard University's Theater Arts Department. We take you now to the American Forum program, which was moderated by Sanford Unger, the dean of the American University's School of Communication. I'm Sanford Unger, dean of the School of Communication here at American University, and want to welcome all of you who are with us in the K Chapel on the American University campus, as well as those who will. Uh, later see this forum on C-SPAN or listen to it on National Public Radio through the assistance of WAMU-FM. Our subject this evening is Malcolm X, the movie, Cinema as History. We will explore a subject that we have explored before, namely the role of a film that is made on a historical figure or a series of historical events and uh, what its contribution to us is intended to be, should be, can be, etc. Our thanks, especially this evening, as usual, to the Xerox Foundation, the Washington Gas Light Company, and Cable Holdings, whose generosity have made these forums possible. We'll have about an hour of discussion and then welcome your questions from the audience. If you'll come to the microphone in the center aisle, I will uh, we'll call on you, ask you to uh, identify yourself and state your questions briefly, and we'll try to give you brief answers. Immediately following the forum, there will be a reception in the private dining room on the first floor of Mary Graydon Center along the quad. I want to introduce our guests this evening, our participants in the forum. To my immediate left is Jackie Jones, who is the editor of Black Film Review and the executive editor of One, Washington's new newspaper on progressive black politics and culture. She's also a contributor to the anthologies Black Popular Culture, Black American Cinema, and associate editor for the film journal Cineast. To her left is Peter Bailey, a columnist at the Richmond Free Press and an editor of Songs of Freedom, an oral history project on the civil rights movement in Virginia's capital. He teaches a course on the black press at Virginia Commonwealth University. And uh, one of the reasons he is of particularly uh, with us this evening is that he was a close associate of Malcolm X and was with him on the day that he was assassinated in 1965. To his left is Christopher Hitchens, who writes a regular column called Minority Reports for The Nation magazine, another called Cultural Elite for Vanity Fair. Uh, Christopher Hitchens started his journalism career with The Times of London as a social science correspondent, later was foreign editor for The New Statesman and is the author of many books. To my right is Al Freeman, Jr., chairman and artistic director of Howard University's Theater Arts Department. Uh, he has a particular reason for being here tonight, too, in that he is a veteran actor who portrayed Elijah Muhammad, the black Muslim leader, in the movie Malcolm X. And we're particularly grateful to Al Freeman, Jr. for taking the time to be here as a member of the cast of the movie. His career spans more than 30 years. He's performed on and off Broadway and won awards for his Emmys for his uh, portrayal, actually, of Malcolm X in Roots 2 and for his work in soap operas. To his right is Pat Dowell, film critic for National Public Radio, WETAFM In These Times, and various other media. Uh, her articles have appeared in The Washington Post, Baltimore Sun, many other places. She is associate editor for the film journal Cineast and lectures on film at local universities. And to her right is Juan Williams, political analyst and national correspondent for The Washington Post, 
He is the author of the non-fiction bestseller Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years, 1954 to 65, and uh, Juan is now writing a biography of the late Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. His writings have appeared in many places, and he's often seen on television programs discussing the news. We are going to begin uh, our forum this evening by showing a few clips uh, from Malcolm X. Let me pause first and ask, how many people in the room have seen Malcolm X? Quite a few. And, and how many of you have seen it uh, more than once? Only a few. Okay. Uh, for those who haven't, we thought, and for those who have, uh, to, to remind you of uh, some things about the film, we thought we would show just a few uh, quick clips of the film and uh, uh, then proceed to our discussion. Now that, I think that means that some of us are going to have to move. No? We're all right? Okay. You go busting your fist against a stone wall. You're not using your brain. That's what the white man wants you to do. Look at you, putting all that poison in your hair. Mm, I think you've been in prison too long, my man, because everybody on the outside comes. Why? Why does everybody on the You can't bust out of here like they do in the movies. Because even if you get out, you're still in prison. Yeah, you ain't lying there. You go busting your fist against a stone wall. You're not using your brain. That's what the white man wants you to do. Look at you, putting all that poison in your hair. Mm, I think you've been in prison too long, my man, because everybody on the outside comes. Why? Why does everybody on the outside come? Because they don't want to walk around with a nappy head looking like... Looking like what? Like me? Like a nigger? Why don't you want to look like what you are? What makes you ashamed of being black? Let me tell you something, I'm not ashamed of being anything. You better get your hands off me, I got to wash this out. Let it burn, nigga, get your hands off of me. Go on, burn yourself, pain yourself. Put all that poison in your hair, in your body, trying to be white. I thought you were smart. Are you just another one of those cats strutting down the avenue in your clown suit with all that mess on you, looking like a monkey? The white man sees you and laughs. He laughs because he knows you ain't white. Man, who are you? No, the question is, who are you? Mind. You're not an American. You're an African who happens to be an American. You have to understand the difference. We didn't come over on the, the Nita, the Pinta, and the, and, the, and the whatchamacallit. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. Landed right on top of us. Shorty, is that you, brother? Praise be to Allah. Now, this is exactly what I'm talking about, the slave mentality, the slave mind. This brother and I, we had the slave mind. We used to rob together. We used to sleep with white women. We even went to prison together. Now, don't be surprised when I say we went to prison, because some of y'all still in prison right now. Prisons of your mind. Stand up, brother. Come on. <laughs> the brother's a little shy. <laughs> Come on, brother. Give me a hug. Yeah. That's all right, brother. That's all right. Look, he still got his hair fried. That's all right, though. That's the slave mind.
man to see Brother Johnson. Who the hell are you? I'm the minister for Muslim Temple Number 7. Never heard of you. Where is he? Nobody here by that name. Wait a second. What is your name, fellow? Don't worry about what my name is. Two witnesses saw Brother Johnson brought in here, beat up. Nobody saw him brought out. You didn't hear the sergeant? Outside. I suggest you look outside that window. Jimmy, come here, sir. Yes, we intend to see Brother Johnson. Who the hell are they supposed to be? They're brothers of Brother Johnson. Eddie, let me take a look at that blotter. Relief must have put it down. Must have. Yeah, but you can't see him. Because you ain't his lawyer. No lawyer, no see. Well, until I'm satisfied that Brother Johnson is receiving proper medical care, nobody will move. Tonight, I shall introduce you as my national minister. It will be a difficult task. Your assignment is to build temples all over this nation. More work than you've ever done in your life. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You will be in the public eye. Beware of them cameras. Oh, the cameras are bad as any narcotic. Double will be watching you every step. And your yeah. own brothers will be jealous, hostile, go slowly. Yes, sir. Today, my friends are black, red, yellow, Brown and white. Malcolm, are you prepared to go to the United Nations at this point and ask that charges be brought against the United States for its treatment of the American Negroes? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, the audience will have to be quiet. Please, please. Yes, as I stated earlier, that um, those nations, African nations, Latin nations, Asian nations, are, are very hypocritical when they stand up in the UN and, and denounce the racism practice in South Africa and at the same time say absolutely nothing about the practice of racism here in American society. Now, I wouldn't be a man if I didn't do so. I would not be a man. Are you prepared now to work with some of the other leaders of some of the other civil rights organizations? Yes, we're prepared to work with any groups, leaders, organizations, as long as they're genuinely interested in uh, results, There's positive right. results. Al Freeman, Jr., what, what was your purpose, or what do you feel was the purpose in making this film? Is this intended as a historical statement? I'm not sure about that. I, uh, my purpose was that I had somewhat of a connection to the film from its beginning. Years ago, when uh, Marvin Wirth bought the property, the autobiography, for Columbia Pictures, uh, and developed four scripts uh, uh, that were not acceptable to Columbia and later uh, Warners bought the project and I had a film at the time of a Leroy, a Leroy Jones uh, play that Warners asked to see uh, which they didn't want to distribute but they asked me to uh, if I would like to direct the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, it turned out that the version they wanted to use was Arnold Pearl's version. By the way, Arnold Pearl did not write the version that is that has his name on it. Uh, that version was a um, a compilation of all the stock footage of Malcolm from the first time uh, Mike Wallace alerted America to this monolithic uh, black group that was out to, 
do terrible things uh, all the way to Malcolm's assassination. What they didn't understand was how to uh, incorporate the autobiography into that format, and I suppose that was to be my job, but I couldn't figure that out either, and suggested that they should start all over again, which they were not uh, going to do, so they uh, went ahead and made that movie. So uh, for me, uh, later on, of course, I played Malcolm in Roots too, and uh, this was the full circle for me. So. Uh, that's the reason why I did it, uh, in any case. Uh, what was your other question? My other question is whether it's a historical document, whether this is a piece of history or a piece of entertainment or a piece of politics. Probably uh, all those things, I suppose. I think Spike set out to do uh, the autobiography, and only that, for which he's been uh, criticized uh, in many instances. There's one student at Howard, for instance, that called the film The Second Assassination of Malcolm X mm. because of its omissions uh, of Malcolm's life toward the end. Uh, but uh, I think that's what Spike set out to do, was to, uh, to really be faithful to the, uh, to the biography, and I think he did that. Peter Bailey, you were with Malcolm X on the day that he died, and I wonder how you view this film. Do you, do you see this as something that rings true for you, or does it have another purpose? Well, uh, being a person who was involved with Brother Malcolm, I, I don't expect a movie on Malcolm X that I would really like to be come out of financed by Warner Brothers. That's where I started from, you know. Mm -hmm. So I always give credit when a black person is able to get something out of a system like that. Uh, and Spike did what I think probably uh, probably as well as he could have done considering that this is a Hollywood movie and, and we know what Hollywood has done to black people throughout its, its history. So I, I did not go to the movie expecting to see, quote, the truth. I just wanted to see what Spike was going to do with it and hope that not too much damage was done to, uh, to the Malcolm X that I knew. And I don't think that he did. I don't think there was very much damage done uh, at all uh, to him. I think that that uh, for young people who, who have not read the book and who probably will not read the autobiography, I always tell them that the movie should be a starting point. And then they go from there to learn uh, more about him. Uh, my own personal uh, feeling about what I consider to be the most serious flaw in the movie is the overemphasis on the big red part of his life and almost total lack of, of uh, clarity on that very, very crucial last year. When you, uh, when you say the big red part of his life, you mean the early stages when he was basically When he a was running through the streets and, you know, and wearing those zoot suits and all of that. I mean, that's Hollywood. Uh, and I think there was too much of that. I mean, you could have dealt with that in about 15 to 20 minutes and then moved on. And by... Um, uh, and doing that, I think that then, then the, that crucial last few years of his life, especially his international thrust, because if you do not understand his international thrust, then you will fall for this whole idea that is being perpetrated, that the United States government had no interest, as one, one writer has written, really did not care enough about what Malcolm X was doing to be concerned about him. And we know better than that. And by not focusing on that, it leaves the impression that the assassination of Malcolm X was just another argument between a bunch of black folks, and one of them ended up killing the other one. When uh, those of us who were involved know that that was not the case, the United States government, as far as I am concerned, was very much involved and very much desired uh, that Malcolm X not be around. And that does not come through clear enough in the movie. I wonder, uh, I think we should ask uh, each of our film critics on this panel, Pat Dowell, uh, how, do you, how do you put together the various purposes of this, of this movie and uh, what do you think it represents? Well, I had very mixed feelings when I went to see Malcolm X because uh, I've admired Spike Lee as a filmmaker and I thought it was by far the most conventional of any of his movies. Um, and that aspect I found disappointing because I thought that he would bring the same kind of uh, really incisive techniques that he brought to say do the right thing to this film but it was very clear I thought what he wanted to do you know he in that he was often quoted when this film was about to be released as saying that 
young kids, young black kids should leave school, should skip school one day and go see Malcolm X. He, and he later sort of retracted that. It wasn't quite what he said anyway. But um, uh, the reason that he felt that way was because when he was a child, he had been taken out of school to go see Gone with the Wind. And it was very clear that he was determined to right that wrong <laughs> and to make a black epic that did the same kind of thing, that had the same sort of sweep and historical breadth uh, and the same mythic proportions, I think, uh, that Gone with the Wind had for kids like him who were forced to see it, or had for white kids, and, and he was forced to see it. He wanted to make sure that uh, he could answer Gone with the Wind, I think. I think that's very clear. Does it, does it answer Gone with the Wind? In its own way it does. You know, it works better as myth than as history, and for all its... I, I say that it's a very conventional film, and, and I think it is. It's a very conventional biopic that mythologizes the man whose life it portrays. But it works rather well as myth, and within the confines of being very conventional, I think that it's a, a rather good teaching tool, an introductory course in Malcolm X, if you will, a, a kind of, one might almost say a Malcolm X made easy, made accessible to a very large audience. And, you know, I mean, it, it, I'm disappointed that it's not a better film than it is, but I'm impressed that it's as good a film as it is. Jackie Jones. Well, um, one thing I'd like to say is I completely agree with Peter, and the thing that's always baffled me about um, kind of the pre-press for this movie was that people seem to be expecting Malcolm X as a movie to be some sort of functional political document for black people, and I don't know how anyone in this country can expect Hollywood to produce such a document. I mean, the whole point of Hollywood is to maintain status quo, and in the society... Um, like ours, that kind of mandates a certain kind of marginalization of, of African Americans and African American history. And so I think what's important about the film is kind of what Pat said, that it is, um, or I think what Peter also said, it's kind of a beginning point to look, to look at Malcolm X, but it also makes a case for a certain kind of legitimacy of the Malcolm X myth. And I think in America, where most of our, our historical figures are judged by things that they do, you know, freeing slaves, integrating schools, whatever, there's been sort of a tension around Malcolm X because more than anything else, he was a leader in the area of thought, and he was a philosopher. And he's one of the first people that I know of, black people, that really criticized the media and really looked constructively at how television and how Hollywood really represented us and what we got out of that. So I think the film does a good job at kind of um, filling in, um, even you know, on a pretty rudimentary level, what Malcolm X has always meant, I think, for black people. So I, th I think that for what it is as a Hollywood biopic, um, I, th I thought it was really good. I thought it was a great starting point. I think it, I would hope that people would go from there and try to know more um, than they'll get from the film, but then, you know, the film at least gives them more than they got from the cap. So I think, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a progress. Is that, is that expecting a lot that people will go on to learn more? Do, do, does the average movie-going audience really do no. that? No, and I mean, the, the thing about, um, you know, our, our heroes and our icons is that very few people really know um, what Thomas Jefferson did, you know, or why he was important. And um, I think that it is a bit much. And I think it's one of the problems with um, black films and black culture in general is that there's a, a, this whole theory that they should mean more than what they mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, Malcolm X is a movie. It's a piece of popular culture. I mean, I think it's important in terms of institutionalizing a myth, an African-American myth, the same way that um, other Hollywood films do that. And not that Malcolm X's legacy is nothing more than a myth, but it is part of American mythology. But what you're saying... I'm sorry, go ahead, Pat. It is worth noting that the hype surrounding the film, the tremendous publicity preceding the film's release and upon its release, obviously did help to catapult the autobiography back to the top of the bestseller list. So obviously, for some people, it was a starting point. Yeah, and that after many years. Uh, well, it's sold well, increasingly well, actually, ever since it was published. Mm -hmm. uh, but it went right to the top of the bestseller list in paperback uh, when the film, as the film was coming out. Juan Williams, you've uh, you've uh, written and 
done for public television history of the civil rights movement. And I wonder uh, whether this whether this film has made you rethink the role of Malcolm X in that history? Well, it's an interesting question because I think one of the functions of caring about the history is thinking about it all the time. So, sure. of course, I experienced the film and <laughs> I rethink what I'm thinking, but I, I don't think it has caused me to uh, revise my conception of Malcolm's place in American history to any substantial extent. And I think the answer to your question is that this movie really is not about history. I think it is a drama in, in terms of what Jackie and Pat said. I think it's presented as Hollywood. Um, and secondly, it's about contemporary politics in that it speaks to the um, current political appetite that exists in America for Malcolm X um, as a defiant and strong black male figure in the society and uh, secondly speaks to the idea of the acceptability now of Malcolm X in terms of modern American political discourse so that you can have um, someone stand up and speak out in anger about the way that whites have historically oppressed black people in the society and then see him go through that tremendous metamorphosis that I think is the heart of Malcolm X's story where he becomes an educated man and he goes through so many transformations. And, um, and you can hold this up to the society, therefore, as acceptable, whereas I think previously uh, Malcolm X was a very threatening symbol to American society, particularly to white American society and to middle-class black American society as well. I think now Malcolm X is more um, of an acceptable figure for many reasons, uh, not the least of which is that uh, people want um, sort of to defang him at this point and to... Uh, make him acceptable. Well, see, that's why I, I, did, I don't think the Malcolm X that they want is more acceptable. The real Malcolm X, who was planning on taking the United States government before the UN up until the day he died, the real Malcolm X is still not acceptable to this country. It is only what they're trying to do is what they do is, is pull out. I think there are two, two kinds of people who basically talk about the big change in Malcolm X. Um, those of us who were involved with him said that the big change in Malcolm X was when he went from being Big Red to being Malcolm X, not when he went from being, you know, the post mech and pre mech or all that St. Paul, you know, type of attitude that many people have about that. Malcolm X, uh, the Malcolm X that I knew this is still very unacceptable to this country. If I got out there right now and started speaking the real Malcolm X to, to people, it would be just as unacceptable now as it was then. And those of us who were involved with him, he probably will remain unacceptable because we are not going to allow them to what we call deball him, which is what they did to the real Martin Luther King. The real Martin Luther King is now Martin Luther, I have a dream king. The man who disrupted whole cities, who became the dominant force in the world against Vietnam, no longer is, hardly exists about Martin Luther King. But we're not going to allow that to happen to Malcolm X. And uh, so I don't think Malcolm X is acceptable at all. I think that they pull out one part of him, you know, the self-help thing, which is, which uh, some black people try to claim began with the so-called black conservatives, but which has been a part of black history for several hundred years. Uh, they pull that out and that becomes what they talk about. But I, I am sure that, for instance, Clarence Thomas uh, would not be supporting the Malcolm X who up until he died had very definite plans on taking this country before the United Nations for violating the human rights of black people. That's the Malcolm X that, that was assassinated on February 21st, 1965. But you happen to be wrong. Um, you know, in fact, I wrote a piece for GQ, which I talked to you for, about how people like Thomas and the black conservatives are now quite happy um, and quite anxious to adapt and adopt Malcolm. I mean, they, they don't even have to adopt. I mean, maybe that's the wrong word, because these are young people who grew up reading the autobiography, these are young people who have uh, taken Malcolm really as uh, kind of the spark that heightened their consciousness in terms of uh, the black nationalist movement in terms of the late 60s, early 70s. These are people who were in college during that period who have not come into the middle class and into power in American society as black people and always felt Malcolm was to some extent their, their secret, you know, that they knew about Malcolm and they loved mm -hmm. Malcolm. Um, and those people actually appreciate 
Malcolm as this challenging figure because he still speaks in their mind, I think, to white America in terms of saying, we're not there yet, you know, and his prophetic statements still carry so much energy and so much power, I think even for this generation of Americans, that they are glad to have him. So it's an interesting embrace, but it's not the case that uh, they would be uncomfortable with him. You know, that uh, really is very curious what you're saying, Juan, because as, a, as both of you were talking, I was thinking that before uh, Spike got involved with this movie, or perhaps even around that time, there seemed to be in the minds of many young black people, as you have said, that appropriated Malcolm for uh, their own sort of cult uh, mythic reasons, uh, that made a climate for this film to be made uh, at uh, somehow having been made and as it is sort of diffused a bit, a bit of that <laughs> which is a, a very curious thing uh, <laughs> which is not what Spike Lee would have expected to happen yeah, not, neither would I so, <laughs> this is just a thought that occurred to me uh, listening to uh, Juan and Peter thinking. Christopher Hitchens um, I've got a friend in... Um, in Jerusalem. Uh, he's an old resistance fighter from, from Europe called Israel Shahak, who now lives in Israel and defends the human and the national uh, rights of the Palestinians. And whenever I call him up and say, how are things? He's prone to reply, well, Christopher, he says, there are encouraging signs of polarization. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that he knows how to think that way, and, and most people don't, and are afraid of confrontation, and um, of polarization, and indeed, indeed always use those words as if they were pejorative. Whereas if you can claim to be a healer or a unifier, you're axiomatically privileged in American society, should make us wonder why it is that actually the consensus has somewhat managed to absorb this movie. It seems to me people underestimate all the time the fantastic equipment of shock absorption that this consensus has. Now, I would say having the book drove me to read the autobiography again and to read James Baldwin's original script for the first time and also to read another book that's very interesting which is Spike Lee's own compilation of the book of the movie contains a lot of the original interviews he did and I think I, I, I'd like to offer just some reasons why I think the consensus has absorbed it partly that's by the will of the critics and most people who write in this country because when they can absorb when they can say that something is healing or entertaining they will, and partly I think it is Spike Lee's fault uh, that, that it was so easily assimilable into the general wet blanket of cultural discussion in, in the United States. Um, if you consider the autobiography, the, uh, the movie interview book that's just called X, you can get in any bookstore, paperback, and the Baldwin script, you'll find four important things I think that are missing, um, or have been rendered blandly. Uh, some critics point out there are some autobiographical details. I think my comrade on the right is quite correct in saying there's much too much show-off stuff of the early pimp days, the, the Malcolm Little days. Partly that's also to give Spike Lee a chance to show off in his zoot suit, let's not forget. <laughs> which which won an Oscar nomination. Which won an Oscar nomination, <laughs> yeah. Which is the bit that gets the Oscar, which I wasn't displeased to see. It was quite fun. So. Then there are things where we, we, even those of us who admire him, can't be certain that the author of the autobiography was telling the truth about his father um, and about the torching of his own house, which is blamed on other black militants, possibly rightly, possibly not. Maybe was uh, self-inflicted torching, but is, th these are just done uncritically. They, these are where it's too authentic in following the book. Too faithful, I mean to say. Then there is the relationship between Malcolm X and two very interesting and very diverse political groups way outside the American consensus. The first of these is the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, a Trotskyist internationalist Marxist group with which Malcolm X was working increasingly closely at the time he was murdered, which was considered to the left of the left and was very much persecuted by the communist and fellow traveling consensus, which had a large part in the, um, the soft center of the civil rights movement. A hard internationalist group with which he, especially in Harlem, he was moving to have relations. The second out group is, of course, the Nation of Islam. Now, since Spike Lee put Farrakhan into Do the Right Thing, where he really had basically no place, no business, and Spike Lee gave, has in the book of the movie a very long and very tough interview with Farrakhan about his relations with Malcolm X. And where the question comes up, Farrakhan called in his papers and uh, other editorials in the same papers called for the murder of Malcolm X. 
And this is discussed and confronted by Spike Lee, who used also the Nation of Islam's youth movement as security for the movie. How come that he just dodges the whole question? How come that the, you wouldn't know there was such a person then or now, and there's both, in the whole film? How come that this, this hard, sharp question is simply left out? We know that Mr. Lee knew of its presence there. Now, I think that if you do leave out these things, there are rewards from critics who say how much you are maturing and how increasingly you earn your place in the respectable consensus, and indeed you may get Academy Award nominations, but you cannot complain if the, if the big embrace moves around to say, well, at least you know how to avoid confrontation. The only thing that brings life to politics or to thought. I, for, uh, uh, I don't have very much criticism of that because if you, Farrakhan at that time was not a big force in the nation of Islam. He really wasn't during the time when Malcolm X uh, was alive. And uh, I think Spike uh, very clearly uh, in that movie, and, and this is, of course, the people that I know who, who are supporters of the nation have been very upset about that, uh, makes it you know, appear that the nation was the instrument for the assassination of Malcolm X. My criticism, and I bring it back to again to what I was saying earlier, that it is no way that you can tell me that the so-called black conservatives agree that the United States should be taken before the United Com Nations Commission for violating the human rights of black people. I wonder if they believe in self-defense. I wonder if they believe in black power. These were all things. You cannot believe in black power and get put on the Supreme Court, you know, and get, it, and get made vice president of IBM. You know, if they were really, if, if they were carrying out these beliefs, this man was about the empowerment, not integration, not separation, not desegregation. He was about power. And the people who claim that they support him are not doing anything about that. In fact, we say that the basic argument between the Clarence Thomases, the Shelby Steeles, and the Thomas Souls, and the Jesse Jacksons, the Andy Youngs, and the, uh, the Benjamin Hooks is over which group of white folks do you attach yourself to? The liberals are the conservatives, the Democrats are the Republicans. Neither of them, neither of those factions is talking about empowering the black community, and that is what Malcolm X was about. You cannot say that you believe in or support or identify with the philosophy of Malcolm X if that is not your focus of your, of your conversation and your action. And I, I'd just like to add to that, um, that, and I think that you have to keep in mind also that the audience for this film generally really isn't people that know Mal knew Malcolm X as, as Peter did or people that have a real grasp of the historical moment. And part of, I think, what the support for Malcolm, where that's come from, is this kind of a feeling that the integration thing has played out, you know, that it hasn't helped the majority of African American youth that, you know, live in inner cities or even middle class black kids that now see like a, a resurgence of racism and are resegregating themselves. I think when you look at, you know, what's come out of rap music, which basically is where the film, how the film was, was made, is that you see exactly what Peter's talking about, that I think a lot of black youth have just completely given up on black leadership, and that reaching back to Malcolm X is the strongest, most effective um, model that they see for self-determination. I, I, I want to come to you, Al Freeman, on this issue of the things that were left out that, that Christopher Hitchens raised. Uh, I know you're not responsible for the script, obviously. I'm not. <laughs> uh, and, and yet I wonder how you react to some of what he said uh, about some of these things being left out of the film, in that sense being sort of sanitized. Well, actually, you know, that was what went through my mind the first time around. I mean, I read all those scripts that were developed, uh, the Calder Willingham script, the James Baldwin treatment, the James Baldwin script, and, and none of them uh, for speaking to the kind of Malcolm that I wanted to see on the screen. But of course, Warner Brothers at that time did not want to even get into that. So later on, here we are, and it's, and it's going round, and I believe a lot of people were expecting to see all those kinds of omissions, that kind of confrontation and some answers to uh, some very deep questions about uh, who and what and why uh, was Malcolm assassinated. And I don't think that... Uh, uh, I, I believe it was deliberately left out by Spike because he wanted to, he hinted at it uh, very broadly, I think. Uh, he didn't name anybody specific, but it was pretty clear that there were some establishment kind of forces that were uh, at work there. And of course, we all know that Malcolm was not admitted into France after he left Mecca. 
Uh, for what reason? Uh, he wasn't admitted in. The Brits wouldn't let him in either. For, for what reason? And that his organization was going to have a, a global kind of constituency. Uh, that was enough to alarm a lot of people. Though. Well, that, the, the assumption there is that the United States asked France and Britain not to let Malcolm X in. I well, mean, we've heard that, and uh, that's quite possible. I don't know, but it was clear that it was, uh, it was some uh, uh, Western influence, certainly, because the Cold War was still on. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Hitchens is actually right that uh, Malcolm did have some leftist connections there. And, uh, of course, uh, Nasser was assassinated, uh, so was Tambo, so was uh, Cabral. Uh, all those people who were assassinated, and, and Malcolm, we were all assassinated at the same time. I mean, it's, it's a Cold War thing, clearly. And, uh, uh, but I don't think, you know, uh, at the di kickoff dinner that Spike gave, uh, Peter was there, and uh, there were a lot of people giving advice to Spike about how he, how he should make Requested the Requested advice. <laughs> yeah. Right. It was. It was. Uh, one was Benjamin 2X, who said, uh, uh, quite openly, that uh, if there were any explicit sex scenes of uh, Malcolm, uh, that uh, the film was going to have a lot of trouble. He said, remember Salman Rushdie? Uh, yes, <laughs> well, you see, I think that was something Spike heard quite clearly that night, and uh, certain scenes got altered in the film. Uh, <laughs> as a now result that's, of that. that. You know, that's an extraordinary statement that a director would labor under that kind of pressure. This is not an ordinary film in that case. This is not the usual mm. process. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of people who put, put pressure on the people who are making films, but... Are you mm -hmm. saying then that, that a director in this country could make a film and let's say, for instance, show Thomas Jefferson in bed with Sally Hemings? I'm or Robert E. Lee, you know, cavorting with one of his, you know, his slave women. You know, I mean, let's be real, this is a real world that we Probably live in. Probably wouldn't be threatened you know. with death. Oh, I think they could. And, uh... He'd be threatened with economic ruin. Right. Instead of actual assassination, mm. if he were to do that. And in fact, uh, people certainly have written about Thomas Jefferson There's a in difference that light in, as well. There's a vast difference in writing about something and putting it on sure. screen. Well, you know, a vast difference in the audience that you're going to reach. I think that, that uh, I was there that evening when, when uh, that statement was made. And, uh, How did you react to that, Peter, to that statement? Well, I was a little bit apprehensive about the Selman Rushdie reference. But if anything that kept that movie from being sleazy, or what I considered... See, I, I think that I might be considered a prude. I think that American movies have become, you know, some of the absolute sleaziest things on the face of the earth. This is all of them, mainly, television, the whole works. So uh, to, to, to do that with Malcolm X would, in my opinion, have been uh, something that Spike, uh, if he took that advice, he was an extremely wise person. <laughs> Um, could I just, sure. I just want to ask you a clarifying question. Um, I, think, I think I know what you mean about uh, Jefferson and Sally and so on, but I, mm -hmm. I think, would you say it was the same thing, that you would have a very hard time getting uh, a film dramatization of J. Edgar Hoover's tapes of Martin Luther King in the motel onto TV now, either? And if... You... you oh, I'm sorry. Chris, it's very hard sorry. to hear <clears throat> If I'm not audible. I'm, I was just taking um, Mayor Corey Peter. You probably would. I mean, people would get very upset Maybe I have the whether question. or not they would be able to, to, to stop it. I don't know, but I do know that people, probably the King people, and I'm assuming this, because they gave up so much to get that holiday that I'm not quite sure what else they're prepared to give up to get a movie. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, on the real Martin Luther King as opposed to the I Have a Dream Martin Luther King. I mean, yeah. they gave up a tremendous amount on him to get the holiday. So I'm not sure what else they would give up in order to get a well, movie I mean, done. I mean, the other night on PBS, there was, in effect, um, footage of um, J. Edgar Hoover in a dress uh, as a transvestite hooker in the, in the Plaza Hotel. Well, there was which not, is actually, in fact, you know, well, in, there were hints of there was more than There was more than hints. There, uh, there was testimony from living witnesses. I thought it was the perfect revenge for Hoover's uh, prurient uh, taping of other people. I thought it was, uh, as is Anthony Summers' book, 
And I bet all, you that will end up in a movie. Which is I think we'll all, see J. Edgar Hoover. Well, yeah, I think that I think we will see J. Edgar Hoover in a in a little nice black little number strutting up and down. <laughs> it will happen. And the reason I'm saying this is not the reason I'm saying this is I do think actually all these things are not only possible but but um, probably necessary. Well, I don't think you can. To me, you can't compare. See, J. Edgar Hoover has been exposed. When you're talking about Malcolm X, to me, as a black person. Then with the white person, you're talking about, you know, Thomas Jefferson. I don't, I, you don't compare Malcolm X with J. Edgar Hoover. All right, fair enough. You know, and uh, if you're going to compare him, you compare him with Thomas Jefferson's and the George Washingtons and the, you know, the uh, the Robert E. Lees, you know, and those kind of people, and how they are treated, the lies that have been told about them in movies and books to, and to glamorize them and everything for centuries. These lies have been told. Uh, I feel lucky in having gotten to know Brother Malcolm is that I personally don't have to look upon him, you know, as a myth, as a god. I can see him as a great black man, not a great man, as a great black man. And, uh, and, and, and so that's what I am looking for. I can, I can see his flaws. I can say that he should not have said the chicken's coming home to roost, not because it was not true, because it was very accurate. But for political reasons, it provided his enemies with ammunition against him. That's the only reason he should not have said it. The statement itself was very accurate. I want to, I want to change the subject for a moment, if I can, because someone said before that this film was uh, made more acceptable, uh, was, was toned down in order to get more, in order to be accepted into the consensus, to get more Academy Award nominations. It did not get very many Academy Award nominations. It got two. It got two. One for costumes. Yes, one for Denzel Washington. Right. Which is uh, certainly well deserved. And it's very strange. In fact, I was even surprised that when people reported on the Academy Award nominations, you didn't hear more people saying, well, the big surprise is that, you know, <laughs> the Academy hasn't given more nominations to Malcolm X. Because, in fact, what we've discussed here is some of its flaws, you know, it's the kind of conventionality and appeal to a large audience and kind of smoothing off the rough edges to be appealing to a large audience. And the mythologizing are all things that in a normal academy year would make them want to shower it with nominations. And I, you know, I think um, that Spike Lee is not appealing to the average academy voter. I think it's pretty clear from this year's nominations and from and frankly, it wasn't frankly it's more of an outrage I think that they ignored Do the Right Thing a few years ago than it is that they but ignored Pat, this film. Are you saying it wasn't it wasn't sanitized enough to get more Academy Award nominations? Is that what you're saying? Well actually no. I I, I think that it's really probably there's a, there's an element of racism in it because there always is when you're talking about black people and white people in America, and uh, but I think that the Academy has a problem with Spike Lee personally with his style, with his his uh, his love of uh, the outrageous publicity statement, you know, his challenges, his his verbal challenges to the Hollywood establishment, that you have to say to some extent he would like to be a part of, I think, and would like to be recognized by. And um, it's, it's an irony for, you know, for him that he can't, that here, I think he really put himself out to please Hollywood, and he couldn't please them enough. And uh, the film has gotten surprisingly few Academy nominations, but even more surprising than that is the fact that it's, you know, you mentioned earlier when we were backstage that it's not in theaters now. Yeah, it seems to have disappeared from the theaters but it's very disappeared quickly in a way from the sort of public discourse that surprises me more I thought considering the amount of controversy that preceded it um, I'm surprised that it is not still you know on the front burner if you will and I think part of that is due to the aggressive way in which it was marketed to some extent by Spike Lee himself I mean once you you know part of the reason why Malcolm X as a figure is more easily assimilated because you know in this movie and as a as the hero of this movie, is because um, he was merchandised so well in advance that it's pretty hard to find him challenging or controversial after, you know, people have his symbol, his last name, X, if you will, plastered all over their hats and their shirts and, you know, on key rings and whatever else. I mean, it's another way of making him into a commodity, literally. 
But it's not a good sell at the movie houses, is it? For three and a half hours, I mean, you can. Well, only... that's a problem that theater owners don't like because sure. they can only show it once a night, right. and they make less money. And you had, and there were curious things connected with the showing of this film in theaters with its run. You remember that uh, very odd controversy, that little scandal in two or three places where people were getting tickets with different names, uh, you know, being sold tickets for, you know, what, I don't know, can't remember what was out in the fall, but they were being sold tickets that had the name of uh, another film playing in the same theater, what which the... meant that when the grosses were tallied up, it might not have been getting its fair share if that was a widespread thing, although I've never heard of that kind of scandal connected with any other film. Well, wasn't it Curious Warner's reaction to that? that it was... Well, they sort of played it down. <laughs> well, that was what did they say? It's their money. Yeah, it's yeah. their money that's being lost, and they were sort of like, well, we just think it's, uh, you know, one or two times it's happened, but mm. it's not a big deal. It's not happening on a large scale. And it really wouldn't uh, be of advantage to a theater owner unless he was trading tickets for Malcolm X with tickets for some film that he'd been playing for a longer time, which is when theater owners begin to make money off of the movie after they've played it for several weeks. But uh, um, Any other thoughts about why it has sort of faded so quickly from public attention, from public discourse, from the theaters? Why didn't it get more nominations? Jackie? Well, I think one thing is, I think people were disappointed in it, um, both black and white. I think people expect it to be made more angry by the film. Mm -hmm. um, I think they expected it to be a more angry kind of a film, and I think what Spike tried to do was kind of humanize the anger that, that had been marketed um, before. So I think that, you know, there were, before the film opened, there was this idea that white people would be up in arms about it because there would be all this racist rhetoric and black people would be moved to, you know, take to the streets, and that's not what the film was. And I think that once that got out, and once, as um, Christopher Hitchens was saying, that once ev all the critics said, oh, this is a wonderful movie, and, <laughs> you know, that it kind of took the sting off of it, really. I may say that I saw, a very, I saw a very agreeable thing. I went with Walter Mosley to see it in New York, the showing, and I saw something I'd, I'd like to see more often, real fear on the faces of Warner Brothers executives and publicity people who were sort of guarding the entrance to the cinema. They really thought that night might end in some kind of a, of a, of this a riot. This was the night of the opening. Yeah, yeah. and it was amazing to see, and, and I realize how much I like to see publicity people look frightened, um, and, <laughs> and I don't see it enough. And th then I realized that, in, f in fact, of course, that it's, it was all in their minds. It must be some kind of guilt complex, I suppose. They don't think the subject can come up without the threat of violence. That's a, that is a compliment of a kind to the subject, but I, the, the fact is, you wouldn't know from seeing the movie why that really potent uh, factor in the thing exists. I want to challenge Peter uh, Williams on something, if I, if, unless I'm, unless I'm um, no, uh, you usurping my, or well, someone else's time. No, I just wanted to hear Peter on this, right. on this point, and then Bailey. Well, see, I think that, I think that it shows, number one, uh, you know, as we like to say, that you know, those black people who come from my perspective, that trying to be acceptable has its limitations. Uh, I mean, not only in making movies, but in other areas. That's why we don't spend a lot of time trying to be acceptable, because it has its, its limitations. I think, number two, despite the fact of, you know, maybe someone like myself uh, feel about the movie, uh, there are some powerful scenes in that movie. There are some powerful scenes that the average white American, despite, and, and this is where I disagree about the idea that the average, white, the average white American has not fallen for this new Malcolm X that they're trying to image. They know what Brother Malcolm was saying. They have not, they have not gone for a moment for this, you know, this new Malcolm X that everybody, you know, that the intellectuals and the critics are talking about. They know better. And so even when they see, you know, like scenes like the, 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 the who, that I love to talk to the young people about, the dictionary scene where he looked at the definitions of black and white, that was a powerful scene for an mm -hmm. American movie. You don't see too many things in American movies right. like that. Uh, the scene with Bane. You should describe that scene a little more thoroughly, actually. Uh, well, it, it was, uh, it's Baines was trying to, 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 and by the way, the, the Baines thing is one of my problems, because it was his brother who introduced him to Elijah Muhammad, and, and not, you know, a stranger, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the prison. But in this particular scene, Baines is trying to, to, to uh, get him to participate and become uh, a member of the Nation of Islam while he's in prison. 
And so in, uh, to explain to him the, the treachery of white society, he takes them to a dictionary and looks up the word black and look up the word white, you know, and devil food's cake, you know, is black cake. We're going to blackball you, you know, we're going to blackmail you. Uh, and then we're going to, if, 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 it's, if, it's, if it's the other cake, it's angel's food cake. And, um, you know, so there's this whole kind of negative connotations that is put around the word black. To me, it was probably one of the most powerful scenes in the movie, the way that was done. I mean, there were a couple of others that had the same kind of effect on me. And uh, uh, I think that, 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 that if Spike had, had, focused, had focused on that uh, more, had talked about the international thing, had, you know, I mean, when Brother Malcolm was invited to the OAU conference to speak, this was a major thing. Uh, no other black American until that time had been invited to, to participate. Not to, I'm sorry, not to participate, but to attend and was allowed to distribute an information. And according to him, they passed a resolution condemning uh, with, uh, the treatment of black people in this country by the United States. So if he had put more of those kinds of things, and I, to me, they are dramatic. I mean, when he got off that plane in Paris, I, had a, I talked to a brother who was there waiting for him in the airport named Carlos Moore. And Carlos said that they, could, they heard, they were waiting for him inside the, the, um, the terminal, and they heard a French journalist come in and say that he was not going to be allowed in. So they ran out of the, and they looked down, and they saw them take him off the plane, put him on a, on a, take him to the other end of the airport and put him on a plane going back to London. So they then ran into this, to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the terminal and called London and told London that he was on his way back. Now, these were, this was the organization of Afro-American unity in Paris. He was going to be speaking before the organization of Afro-American unity in Paris. These were basically uh, black people from this country, from Africa, and from the Caribbean who had formed this group in Paris. And to me, that's very, that's dramatic. You know, it would have made a great scene in a movie. Mm -hmm. and, and to not put it in was puzzling to me because once again, it, by not doing this, I believe, it, it, uh, it uh, quieted down or negated the role that the United States government and the vital interest they had in seeing Malcolm X no longer around. Can One, I ask, I'm sorry, can yes. I, I, I'm just wondering if you, I mean, I, I thought some of that stuff that was missing from the film, I was wondering if that was in the film, if that film would have been made. You know, because I think there's... That's what I'm talking about. You know, about. I mean, because I think that a lot of people want to kind of slight, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but kind of want to slight Spike about not putting this in and not putting that in. And I think a lot of that is why the movie didn't get made before now. And I also think that there's some, and I wonder kind of how you feel about this, I think that there's some value to how conventional the film is. And like you say, the, the, the scene about the black and the white, and some of the speeches where Malcolm X is really talking about self-image and, you know, what you see when you look in the mirror and those kinds of things, which really, I mean, have never been said before in an American movie. movie yeah. And this movie also, to me, has the potential of being, like, on television on Saturdays in 10 years so that, you know, young people that are growing up will see that and they'll see those scenes with the dictionary and they'll see someone really challenging our own assumptions about who we are as, as African Americans. And I think that, I mean, the myth... Um, aspect of it. I think it's important. Um, and I was wondering how, how you felt. I mean, I didn't know Malcolm X, so it's, that's my relationship to it. Well, this is, this is when, I, you know, when I'm saying the things that are left out, I'm not doing this so much to be critical of Spike mm -hmm. uh, as such, because as I said before, you know, understanding you know, where we live and the system, the Malcolm X movie that I would like to see is not going to be financed by Warner Brothers. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's not going to be financed by Warner Juan, Brothers. Juan Williams. Your thoughts on why this movie seems to have flared out so quickly? Well, I don't think, I, don't, I think a lot of people were disappointed. I think Jackie said that, that people were disappointed black and white in terms of the uh, conventionality of the film, its length. The, the sting to this movie before it was made was the idea that it was going to be such a red hot, angry, in your face. Um, you know, to hell with white people type of movie, and that they were going to focus in on that part of Malcolm X and blow that part out of proportion, I think, to the, to the reality of him, but blow it, that part out of proportion and focus on it 
and use it to condemn American society and to point out uh, you know, the oppressive tactics of American society and therefore people were going to be outraged, people were going to be threatened that the doors to the cinema needed to be guarded. That was the power of the movie. And I don't think in that kind of uh, current so it political didn't discourse that, it didn't accomplish that end at all. So then people were disappointed, you mean? Well, I think people were disappointed who wanted the film as a vehicle for that kind of discussion. I think that's why Peter might be disappointed. I'm disappointed with when I hear Peter say that he approves of someone sitting at a dinner table with an artist and saying um, that he might be scorned or, uh, you know, somehow treated like Salman Rushdie or assassin or something for something he might do in the course of his art. I don't think there's any excuse for that kind of thing. I think it downplays the idea that art could be repressed or oppressed in our society and then you might make excuse and say well I want the art to do this or do that which is the myth making function that this film has to fulfill for Malcolm X but to my mind that's corrupt uh, and it doesn't serve any good purpose it, it serves the purpose of saying to people um, this film is really hagiography. it has nothing to do with reality it has everything to do with what some people want to say to white American society in 1993 as opposed to a true artistic document about a tremendous life. Well, see, I, 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 we, will, we probably could never agree, Juan, because I don't believe, I, I think that art is propaganda. I think that art is propaganda. When I go to see a movie uh, as a child and I saw those Tarzan movies and I'm sitting there cheering Tarzan and, and, and Cheetah, as they wiped out a whole group of African warriors. You know, I mean, for, to some people, that's art. To me, that was propaganda. You know, and, and I know that people are making decisions about that, and, and those decisions are made today about what is. There are certain things about Jewish people in this country you're not going to put in a movie. I don't care how artistic you are because of the power they have to stop it. You know, and other groups. And so I don't get upset by artists not being able to do everything they want because no artist can do everything that he or she wants in this society. We, and we have less boundaries than anyone else. So what are you going to do then? You're going to hold a gun to the head of every artist and especially every black artist and black writer in America and say, you must be politically correct or you no. don't serve the cause? I think that's crazy. I'm not, that, I don't say that, anything to them. I don't let, to me, I, I'm only... No, what you said was, only, you said something's going on with Jewish Americans. You got so much Jewish... I want to know what it is that we don't see about Jewish Americans. Okay. I saw a movie the other day on TV about white guys having sex with black women and misogyny in this country. Was, uh, that's Juan, I'm only thing. interested... Let's I don't it. see the point let, here, Let me Peter. tell you about something about myself so that we'll be very clear on this. I have reached a state in my life that I am only interested in... I am not interested in... Journalists, writers, artists, farmers, lawyers, doctors who describe themselves as I am not a black artist. I am an artist who happens to be black. I will not criticize those people because as far as I'm concerned, I, le I believe in letting any black person be whatever they want to be. I personally am interested in black artists. That's all I'm interested in. I will not argue with the artist. In fact, I told someone that once who said to me, I'm an artist who happens, I'm a right, I was doing an article on actors and told me that they were an actor who happens to be black. And so I told him, I said, fine, then I will not interview you because when I get an assignment to do an article on actors who happen to be black, I'll give you a ring. I'm interested in black <laughs> actors. I'm interested in black actors. And so you will not find me that statement that you talk about. I would never make it because I did not expect, unlike what you just said, I did not expect, Juan, this movie to be the movie of Malcolm X that I would want to make. You, you cannot, you, you would be an idiot to think that Warner Brothers is going to put up $30 million to do the kind of movie on Malcolm X that would do the things that I believe and that would show the Malcolm X that I feel as though I knew. I just never expected that. I, always, I don't expect a black journalist on the Washington Post you know, to be able to do the kind of articles that I think need to be done. If he ever if he gets one in every now and then, I give him credit. But I do not criticize him because, you know, he can't do those kind of articles. I don't expect the Washington Post to be an instrument for black liberation. And I didn't expect this Warner Brothers movies to, movie to be. But I feel as though Spike should be given credit. I think he got as much as he could considering the circumstances. But I do criticize some things that I think that he could have, that he might have gotten into the movie that were not uh, okay, there. Okay, well, a couple, uh, go, go ahead, Juan. You, you, 
What, let me say this. If you have questions, come to the microphone in the center aisle now, so we'll know how many of you there are, and we can start adjusting to that reality. In the meantime, I want Juan to have a chance to answer. I want Christopher to have an opportunity to raise his point with Peter, and, I, and Jackie was trying to say something, too. My thing has to do with what they're talking about. Okay, well, so why don't you go next, then? Go ahead. I, I just wanted to say one thing about what Juan said, because I think when you look at a Hollywood film that, I mean, I don't, I don't think that anybody should be threatened with their life about having nudity in their films, but, I mean, Spike Lee's already been told a number of things that he can and cannot do, and Holly, I think it's kind of dangerous to talk about Hollywood as art anyway. You know, I mean, this is not like I'm at home painting, you know, a, a watercolor. I mean, these are very political decisions that are economically and politically mandated. And I think to, for somebody to threaten you with your life is one thing, but Warner Brothers was threatening with no money. And it's, and it's I mean, I don't think that it's, a, it's an issue of being politically correct. It's an issue of creating something in a capital-intensive marketplace. You know? Well, that's what we're talking about. And it's contradictory, though, what you're saying to what Peter's saying, because you're saying that the economics of it would dictate the kind of film that would be made. And yet, at the same time, Peter's saying, well, he didn't expect anything out of the film because Warner Brothers was willing to put up the $30 million. And eventually, I think it, it rose to $40 million, money from other sources that I'm were, saying that economically were backing the film. So you see, I mean, there's a contradiction in terms of what's being said here. But it all comes back to this idea um, that I think has been best articulated here by Peter, that somehow the film is, it would have served best as propaganda. And that he's, the failure of the film in his mind is that it didn't serve that purpose. And then he will say that if Spike Lee would say that he's a filmmaker who happens to be black as opposed to a black filmmaker, then somehow you would never expect anything from such a person. Every anyway. film is propaganda from my perspective. Right. Every film. So there is no such thing as art. There would no. no. That's right. So there would be no such thing as an artistic film about Malcolm X. I disagree. I think you could do that. I there think can be, make... propaganda can be done artistically. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Because I mean, I, when you look I at... I think you could do a film that would challenge American society, be less conventional. Um, and I think the film could have done much more in that way. I am very concerned, though, when I see people who would take every effort of a, let's say, a Richard Wright, or now a Spike Lee, and say that it does not conform to their standards of wh how black America should be presented, and therefore ill serves the community. I think that is basically putting every artist in some sort of harness that would limit their creativity. I agree with you, but there are more scripts in Hollywood that do accurately challenge the status quo and that do accurately represent African American life in a more full and rich you know, kind of way that will never be made. I mean, the scripts are there, the people are there to produce them, and they're not made because those decisions are made by Hollywood. You know, it's an economic and political system that, I mean, it's a reality. I don't want to yeah, cut anybody off, but we face some realities of people who want to ask questions. Okay. And I think maybe some of our other points will come out through the answers to what I hope will be the brief questions that will be stated. And, and Christopher, I promise we'll get back to the point you want to make. Uh, so tell us who you are and ask a Quick question, please. My name is Aaron Brickman. I'm a student here at AU in the School for International Service. Uh, Mr. Bailey, uh, I agreed with most of what you said uh, up until the point about uh, Jewish Americans. Um, unfortunately, I lost all respect for you as soon as you said that. I would like you to expand on the point about Jews that we don't know about. What, in your mind, do we not know about the Jews of this country, sir? Well, you know, first of all, I simply, your losing respect for me does not cause me a lot of problems. But, uh, uh, but you do owe him an answer. What I said was, what I said was that, that the Jewish community in this country is very, very powerful. And, I'm not, and, and I admire that power because they are able to protect and defend their interests. And if we could only do it in the same way. And there are movies, uh, you see all the time, when we, uh, about the, the Jewish community fighting to, to, to keep certain things uh, in the history books, when people start challenging the, the, the Holocaust uh, and writing things that are, that are different, with, they go after them tooth and nails. And, when, and I want to make it very clear, I am not criticizing that. I think that is exactly what a group has to do to protect its interests. I'm only saying that we, and by we, I mean black people should follow that same strategy when promoting and defending our interests in this society. That's all I am saying. Why don't you answer the question, Peter? He said to you, what don't we know about Jewish people in America? What do, 
don't we know about Anglo-Saxon people? What don't we know about black people? That's not a question. Okay. What don't we know about Jewish people? What is what is what are you saying? All I was asking was for you to answer the direction. Okay, then what? What don't we know about Jewish people? What don't we know about black people? What don't we know about Anglo-Saxons? What don't we know about Polish people? I mean, there are a lot of things that we don't know about a lot of people in this country. I don't really understand. I personally, I'd be very, I'm serious. I do not understand the question. Well, if, if, you I, may, if I may Pat. interpret. I have no problems answering it if someone will make it clear. Pat, step well, in. It seemed to me that what he was saying is that you raised the point, you said, you said in an earlier uh, statement, mm -hmm. there are things that you could not portray in a film about Jewish people in America. And I think he was asking, what are those things? Okay, I want to ask you a question. Could I, as a black filmmaker, make a film in this country that said that uh, the Holocaust is a myth? Could I, as a black filmmaker, make a film that even suggests that? What would that be telling people about Jews that they didn't know? Okay, I'm, no, I'm, no, sir, wait, I'm asking, I'm asking I mean, that no, question. Is, but I don't think you're answering the question that, asks, that has been asked now by two people of you to explain, to further explain the statement that you made. You made a statement. Why won't you answer the question about the statement you made? I don't, what, I don't understand the question. <laughs> what about Jewish people we don't I, know? What? You said that. You're the one who I said that. I did not that. say that. Well, in that case, I think we okay. move on. I think we should probably yeah. just go I think on. we're going to move on. Let me close very quickly. I think we're going to move on. I was, what I was saying, I was, what I was saying, if it was misinterpreted, I was saying I was admiring the ability and the power of the Jewish people in this country to promote and defend their interests. I think we'll That's what I was doing. I think we'll take that as a clarification okay. and move on to the next question. Uh, Raul Kohlberg, University of D.C. Learning Resources faculty. I'd like to direct a question to Mr. Freeman with regard to uh, his portrayal uh, of Elijah Muhammad. I wondered if the script as you got it changed, uh, remained substantially the same or changed at all in the process of making the film. And was there anything particular that you were striving to do in a uh, portrayal of Mr. Muhammad? Were you satisfied and did you try for any particular historic aspect that you were uh, portraying in the uh, character? Well, I'm content. Uh, I was, the thought occurred that if I had gotten that one wrong, I'd take the next fruit truck to uh, Oklahoma or somewhere. Uh, it was a uh, 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 difficult uh, uh, task, as you might imagine. Uh, Elijah had a fourth grade education. Uh, he did not have a grand command of English grammar. Uh, many uh, things he said uh, were not grammatically said well. Uh, however, the transcripts of his speeches were all cleaned up so that uh, what was important was his message and not uh, just how he said it. So I had to sort of try to walk a line uh, between what people expected of him, the ones who knew him, and how he sounded and how he talked, and to uh, try not to uh, in any way uh, uh, make uh, uh, a chance for other people to say that this was an illiterate man and that he had nothing uh, really that was important to say that would have swayed so many people, uh, when in fact I think he did, and I think he articulated it very well in his own way, so that was uh, my task. Let uh, me ask a follow-up question there, uh, Al. Did, did you feel political pressure no. of the sort that was described before on Spike Lee? Did you feel that if you, if you, uh, if, if you portrayed uh, Elijah Muhammad as too, un, as too unsympathetic a character that, that, that you would have problems? No. I, uh, despite jokingly said Farrakhan was very interested in the portrayal of Elijah Muhammad, but I, I never took that seriously. And clearly uh, there were enough uh, of, of uh, audio tapes and videotapes of, of Elijah uh, where uh, the man got, was very clear uh, and his ideas, his, the manner of, of how he started putting things together and we put those in the film. So those were the changes that were made there. Uh, after all, most of the scenes, except for the, the public scenes and the, and the rallies and all that, were, were just with me and Denzel behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. Both men were dead, so uh, we didn't really know 
what they said to each other. We could only surmise from the events that we know about that happened before and, and after uh, those meetings. Uh, so uh, I think uh, people are generally satisfied that uh, we got it somewhat close. Uh, and I am too. I'm relieved. You know, uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, many people, especially Elijah's followers, uh, really deified the man. They, uh, they uh, had him way up on a pedestal. He was expected to say something profound every moment he opened his mouth. And uh, that had to put an awful lot of pressure on him. And I thought perhaps that uh, that isolated him a little bit because uh, there must have been times when he didn't have profound things to say and in whom could he confide. So uh, it, it, uh, it, that, that made him human for me, and uh, therefore made him accessible as uh, somebody to play. Next question. Hi, um, my name is Jason Tan, and I'm a sophomore at the School of Communication here. Um, Mr. Bailey, if I understand you correctly, um, what I what I understood you to uh, to say was that. Um, Spike was somewhat in a catch-22 situation in making uh, Malcolm X in that his attempts to, uh, to make the Malcolm X that you and I believe um, much more of the black community who knew Malcolm, whom you wanted to see portrayed on the screen, um, that was not going to happen because of Hollywood's um, it, um, its, uh, ability to uh, more or less um, well, to actually approve or disapprove what goes on the screen, especially with Warner, Bill, uh, Warner Brothers putting $30 million into the film itself. Um, I was wondering if exactly you see this, uh, this type of Catch-22 as something that's a statement that um, um, a blanket situation for all of the black community um, and it's um, how this uh, re relates to your, your comments on uh, empowerment of the black community itself. I, I, I basically, uh, as I said earlier, uh, did not believe for a moment that, that this movie was going to be the kind of movie that I personally would, would want to see on Malcolm X or would make if I were able to make a movie on Malcolm X because I just don't expect Warner Brothers to do such a thing. I don't, it's, and, and, it's, and it's on other levels. As a, I'm a journalist. I don't expect the New York Times to be an instrument for black liberation. So when, you know, I don't expect CBS, you know, uh, American University, you know, places of these types to be instruments of black liberation. So those black people who work at these institutions and who work as Spike did with this movie, I believe they, they do the best they can do and what, whatever little bit you can get out of that, you get it. But for me to sit back and say that American University is going to be, you know, a, a black college and going to become an instrument for, for the empowerment of black people, I would have to be an idiot. Okay, what would exactly would be the best suggestion of, of yours to get for black industry to It's for the black country. people in this country to pull themselves together and develop themselves politically, economically, and culturally as a group of people. And then once you do that, then you can begin, you can deal with every other group of people in this country on any level that either of you choose to. Let's That's all I'm saying. Next question, please. Um, I wanted to say initially, um, I totally agree uh, with your statement, Mr. Bailey. My name is Martina Cartwright, and I'm chairperson of the Black Law Students Association here at the American University. And as a young African-American woman, I can't say that uh, the movie Malcolm X satisfied me totally. I didn't look at it as just pure entertainment or some type of educational facility from which I learned a great deal about Malcolm X. Uh, borrowing a statement from Mario Van Peebles about his movie New Jack City, I looked at it as edutainment you know, where both educated and entertained. But I know I certainly walked away from the movie feeling uh, somewhat confused, very, uh, just like I'd been left, you know, totally unsatisfied. And the one thing that I, I felt like I, I, like a lot of African Americans like myself walked away from the movie doing was researching. I went and I spoke to individuals who lived around that particular time who were involved in the black, uh, the black movement at that time. I read as many books as I could uh, to learn everything about Malcolm X, to understand the man and to understand more about why he so appeals to young African Americans. And I think his appeal to us is the fact that he emphasized uh, not just self-importance, but, but self-empowerment. Us taking charge of ourselves, taking charge of our community, giving back to our communities. I, I guess I just wanted to um, probably get some input from the panelists on that. 
Okay, my name. I, I don't think. Does anyone want to comment on that? Uh, I just want to say. Mr. Bailey, I just want to say amen. <laughs> and Christopher, do you have something you want to say? Well, actually, yes. If you'll say amen, then I think it might be the occasion for my to my uh, indicate my uh, slight but um, I hope noticeable dissent. Look. Everybody knows what a serious topic this is. We're talking about the struggle for liberation of the only large group of people who did not come to America of their own free will and who used to be property. Okay? You would, I think, be surprised how many people have got that point uh, and, realize, and appreciate the seriousness of it. The difference I have with you is <clears throat> really when you say that if, it's, if, the, if there's anything good in the movie, it's Brother Lee. If there's anything bad, it is Warner Brothers. I have not heard Mr. Lee say, I'd have made a better film if Warner Brothers didn't give me 40 million bucks. If he wants to say it, he has enough money, and I would hope enough courage to say so. I also think that you're in danger when you say all, all art is propaganda, of basically saying that all propaganda is art or would be considered artistic by you as long as it was made by black people. Now, no, that, well, no. that's what you said, or in, that's what you were, broadly, you were broadly hinting, that no one else's opinion was of very much interest to you, which is, of course, you're right. But I'll give you an example from the movie and the autobiography that will face you, if I'm correct, with a choice. Mm -hmm. On the chickens coming home to roost, which you said you thought tactically should not have been said, the, in my view, perfectly brilliant speech made by Malcolm X about the murder of Kennedy and what it meant in terms of the culture of assassination and destabilization, you said tactically you'd rather that hadn't been made. Actually, the real trouble in real life that Malcolm X got into was over saying that he didn't care about the, the crash of a plane load of uh, white travel agents in Chicago because why should he care about a plane load of crackers? Which I think you'll agree is a different statement culturally and intellectually from saying that there was some revenge involved in the, to the culture of violence in the murder of the president. Now, in the movie there is a moment, which everyone remembers, where a young, concerned, honky woman of the kind we're all used to condescending to, and anyone who can, talk, who can pronounce the word empowerment, knows how to despise people like this. She comes up to, to Malcolm and his group at Columbia, and she says, look, uh, I would really like to do something to help, and I'd like to know what it is. And he says, nothing. There's nothing you can do. She turns away. And Spike Lee, who dodges all really important political questions in the film, is not above sending racial thrills of this kind through audiences. And so I thought it was appalling that that story, which indeed appears in the autobiography, is only told in the autobiography because Malcolm X says he wishes he now knew where that girl was. Because he, he wished he hadn't said that to her, and he wished he could find her and talk to her. Has a little more respect for the opinions of some white people say than, than you do, uh, to, make, to make my point direct. Um, and is not going to make innuendos about whether they're Anglo-Saxon, Polish, or Jewish either. In other words, isn't a tribalist. Now, if I ask you this question, do you think that Malcolm X was right to say that in his book about the girl? And if you don't think you mean so, right why not? right to say not? that he was sorry. That, that he was he... sorry. And do you agree that's what he did say? And if not, why not? And if that is the state of affairs in the book, is it Warner Brothers' fault that Spike Lee opens that quotation mark in the film and then fails to close it again and leaves people with a, a deformed impression of what the politics of the movie and indeed this discussion really are? Well, I think that... that he, I, he himself said that he was sorry he made that statement. Yes. Malcolm X did say, and I have the statement that he made, that those whites who are sincere, this is a change, should work in their own communities. That's what he said. He said that he found that those whites, quote, who accepted Islam, end of quote, had been able to transcend racism. We got to be very careful about what he said about this. So what he did, which by making that statement about sincere, but you would be surprised. I, can't, I worked in the movement in the 60s. What a difficult time that we had getting that concept through to white people. They all wanted to work in Harlem. And we kept telling them, go to Bayside, go to Bensonhurst. Organize out there. That's where you can organize. We can't go out there. They didn't want to hear it. They wanted to come to Harlem. And I tell you very frankly, we, we, we regarded that as a missionary uh, concept and we resented it tremendously. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the change in Brother Malcolm from what he was saying when he was in the nation and what he said with OEAU was his statement that those whites who were sincere should organize and work in their own communities because this is where the problem was and where they could be most effective. There were not going to be any white members of the OAAU, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, that I can guarantee you.
Okay. Uh, Next question. Okay. My name is Salomon Carrasco. I'm a teacher and journalist. I'm interested in intellectual level rather than just discussion. Uh, I know Marco Musso was radical. I read all literature. Uh, this uh, propaganda, whatever the movies, maybe for integration going on, is good also. But my question is this. We know already how he radical was in the past. I see the present. Now, as you try to be expert explaining us how we have to resolve these problems in the future. I'm interested in present to the future rather than the past. Anyone, I like to intellectually put you with your ideology, with your theory, with your philosophies. I like to know. Juan? You want to know how to resolve the issue of race in American society? That's, that's the old problem we have. Well, we I have agree to ask you for a brief answer. <laughs> 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 well, I think that part of the, uh, the way to resolve the problem is through empowerment, as we've been talking about, a certain sense of educational and making sure that people have equitable opportunities to, uh, to live full lives so that uh, we address in some way the historical advantage that comes from the fact that black people in this country were property and were legally, uh, through government enforcement, uh, segregated and oppressed in terms of educational and economic opportunities, that the government has to take some steps in that direction. At the same time, you have to have this learning experience, I think, of exposure to people so that there's more of an opportunity for people in this society uh, to become acquainted with each other and their talents rather than to delve into the stereotypes about blacks or Jews or any other group that I think are very, very um, damaging. Um, and I think all of that has to come about as you have a p struggle over power because much of this has to do with the unstated equation that power has, res has been held in certain hands in this society, especially wealth is power for a great deal of time for the history of this country and that we have to somehow uh, address in within a capitalistic system that basic inequity. Thank you. Next question. And if we could try to keep the questions brief, I'd appreciate it because we're really over our time, but I want to l allow people to yeah, have their evening. My name is Ernest Johnson. I'm with the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. I'm chairman of the Statehood Grassroots Committee here in Washington, D.C. Um, American University is my alma mater. I'm out of the School of Justice um, also. Um, and by the way, uh, one of my fellow students uh, and a member of the School of Communications from Southeast Washington, uh, Russell Williams, uh, two-time Oscar winner, uh, did the sound on the movie uh, Malcolm X. So I think he should have got an Oscar just because he's from Southeast. <laughs> <laughs> he's had two Oscars and he's very... Yeah, he should have had a third one. When you come out of Southeast, you need three. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen the movie, uh, to be quite honest. Um, I haven't found the need to rush out to see it. I, you know, I will get a chance. I think, you know, at my age, I've kind of like lived the experience. And I'm glad to have lived during the lifetime of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Um, sometimes it kind of like bothers me when we have these discussions and then they kind of like almost denigrate to the point of where they did just now. I don't think that that dialogue kind of like helps anything. And I think that we have a problem with looking at Malcolm X and Martin Luther King in terms of absolutism. You know, they have to be absolutely correct. They have to be absolutely perfect. And I think that that's unrealistic to look at anybody in that manner. And I think what we need to begin to do is to start to look at the good in people and the goodness that they do and see if we can uplift humanity, black people in particular and all people in general. And I think when we start to look at things from that perspective, we begin to get more things done in this society. Right here in Washington, the last four years, we've had 2,500 people killed. Uh, we have 200,000 people unemployed or underemployed. 30% of our population is on public assistance. Only 30,000 people make over $60,000 uh, in a book. 11,000 people on a five and a half year waiting list for public housing. The list goes on and on and on. So I'm saying dialogue is good. Dialogue has its place. 
But the thing that I take from Malcolm, the thing that I take from Martin Luther King is a commitment for activism, a commitment to be involved, a commitment to change and bring some things about. I can't really imagine Malcolm X or Martin Luther King sitting on a panel even discussing a the movie. They would be somewhere trying to change and bring about uh, well, the uplifting of our society. Um, I'll take the blame for the fact that people are here on the panel. Oh, no, it's a good form. I, 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 I'm not But we trust that they will do important other it's, things It's It's, it's, it's well. a real good form, and, you know, this is my model, and you have some of no, the people understand. on this panel that I, I really love and respect. I really do. I, I think time for criticism and all of that is, 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 is way past. I'm just saying that the problems in Washington and the problems of America is going to require that all of us begin to kind of, like, get involved and see what we have in common rather than always what we don't have in common. Always criticizing each other, always at each other's throats. You know, we're in a real serious time in our society where we got some major problems. And I'd just like to see us come together. I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, good evening. My name is Asantua Nkrumah Ture. And I'd like to give thanks and praises to Brother Peter Bailey. Um, I agree with you, brother. There were a lot of different things left out of the movie. You lived through it, and you knew Malcolm. Uh, as someone who's been researching Malcolm, though, as the brother said, the things that were left out were very significant. Malcolm X made a speech called Message to the Grassroots. That wasn't there. Malcolm X uh, met Fidel Castro at the Hotel Teresa in Harlem. That wasn't there. Malcolm X visited Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, correct me if I'm wrong, brother, and some other countries in Africa, and he met the revolutionary leaders of that time, Nkrumah, Seko Ture, Modi Bokeita, Amilcar Cabral, Oliver Tambo, etc., etc. He also met Nasser when he was in Egypt. He wasn't just riding around on a camel as a tourist, okay? When Malcolm X was in Egypt meeting with Nasser, they had meetings and discussions about Zionism. Malcolm X wrote an article called Zionist Logic, and in that article he equated Zionism with American imperialism, American dollarism. He supported the rights of the Palestinians. That was not in the movie for obvious reasons. So to get back to this gentleman's question here, uh, art is a form of propaganda. It sells an idea. It gets people thinking certain types of things. And because these things and others were left out, people have a certain view about Malcolm. It's a distorted view, and they're making a view based on a lie. And for our young people, for African young people, that's very dangerous. We want the truth to our young people. And to this to gentleman back here, I know for a fact that Warner Brothers put political pressure on Spike Lee about that movie because they asked him, uh, they asked uh, a brother who was a consultant to the movie, how are you going to deal with Malcolm and his visit to the Middle East? Well, that was an obvious reason for that question. They didn't want to have on that film Malcolm talking about Palestinians. That's a bad word these days particularly in light of the, the Middle East uh, peace talks. You will never see in a movie in America anyway uh, a man named Lenny Brenner who's a European anti-Zionist Jew. And he speaks all around the country, but you don't have him on PBS. There are a number of Jews around the world who are different races who were organizing and speaking out against the creation of the State of Israel, but you, don't, you will not have them on TV too. So as the brother said, Art and propaganda are very related, and for our people, as oppressed and exploited as we are, we have to make a conscious decision that art and every other skill that we have as a people must serve our liberation, and if it does not, you will face the consequences. Can I, can I just make a... Oh. I want to say, repeat what I said earlier. I admire, and I'm, not, I'm using this term deliberately, I admire the Jewish people for their ability to promote and defend their interests. I only wish that we as black people could be as effective. That's, that was the point I was making earlier, and I want to repeat it. That is what I was saying. I admire their ability to defend and promote their interests. That's exactly what a group of people is supposed to do. And this country would be in better shape, and we would be in better shape, if we were as tenaciously uh, in our abilities to defend and, and promote our interests. I think we'll go to the next question. If I could ask you, please, I, I really don't want to deny anyone a right to speak, but it's getting late. We're over our time, and we really have not opened the microphone for rhetoric, but for addressing the subject of the forum. Thank you. Hakeem Muhammad is my name. Um, 
Mr. Freeman, I think you did an excellent job with portrayal of uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Thank you. I want to give you those credos first. Uh, Brother Bailey, I want to also say that I think you're right on the mark. Uh, we are aware that, again, the Jewish lobby is very, very significant here in this country. Um, I also want to get a comment from you in terms of the portrayal of Elijah Muhammad with regard to Malcolm X, Brother Malcolm X. And also, what is your view in terms of the portrayal of the Nation of Islam after the showing of Malcolm X? Well, it's very difficult to talk about Elijah Muhammad in that kind of way because, the, see, I regard, as I said earlier, I regard Malcolm X as a man, as a great black man. The people who believe in Elijah Muhammad regard him as almost like a God figure. And it is as difficult, and I've had some very, I've stopped, you know, arguing with, with, with members of the nation about that. Because whereas I can admit uh, Brother Malcolm's flaws and some things that I felt as though he could have done differently, they cannot admit that Elijah Muhammad could do anything wrong because they regard him as a god, any more than any other people who are involved in a religious thing can admit that their leader, you know, that that, that religious leader did something wrong. So it's very, I can admit, it's very difficult to discuss that on any level. And so I stick with Brother Malcolm and as a man, and, and I look upon him as a great man, but I do not look upon him as a god. And he did make mistakes, and I'm prepared to say this. Uh, but that does not take away from what he was preaching and what he was saying and the, and the righteousness of what he was trying to get us to do as a people in order to empower ourselves in this country. Next question. My name is Tara Finnell. I go to Duke Ellington School of the Arts. First, I would like to speak as an individual. I have two comments to make. I wanted to refer back to the comment made about the burning house and how there were some accusations as it not being true. I was not aware of this until tonight when it was said, but I saw something different than the surface meaning. I saw that coming to the point where Malcolm realized that universalism was the way. Spike Lee was trying to show through those two burning houses, the one when the KKK burned it, and then the other when it was inferred that the Nation of Islam may have had some part in it, that evil lies within the soul and not within the color. And I think that was a very important point, especially at the end of the movie when Malcolm X had come to the realization that universalism was the way. My second comment is coming from an African-American student and a product of the District of Columbia Public School System. Um, you all were talking, oh God, I forgot what I was gonna say. All right. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll have to come back. But that was, that was the main point I was trying to make about the house. I think you all missed that point, or, if, or maybe it just came from me. But that was very important to me. Oh, no, I know what my point was. You all said that the Spike Lee movie was supposed to cause some sort of um, confusion within the nation with the youth and all that stuff. I think it didn't for a number of reasons, but the main reason is that I think it numbified the youth so much that when they left that movie, the only thing they could do was think. I think it was a little bit sketchy, but as someone who wasn't that educated about Malcolm X, I did read the book, I saw that he was extremely powerful and that gave me a lot of pride in my race as a student, something that I rarely see in the movies now with all the subliminal messages. So I think it numbified the youth so much that they couldn't react physically. It was all a mental learning experience. Thank you. Thank you. Next. We'll my, just take these last two. My name is Nicole Morgan, and I'm a student here uh, at the School of Communications. I'm a broadcast journalism major. I have two brief questions. First, for Mr. Bailey, if you can briefly uh, summarize some of the changes that took place within the nation after uh, Malcolm X was killed and after um, Spike Lee's movie has come out. And from the critics, I would like to know if they're ever going to pull themselves together to recognize good art when they see it and put their differences aside about how it's done and to give awards where they're due? You said about the, the changes, changes in the nation, the nation of Islam after <laughs> Malcolm X was killed and since the movie has come out. Okay, first of all, I think uh, I was not a member of the nation. I was never a Muslim, even when I was working with Brother Malcolm, when he formed the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. I was a part of the political, economic, cultural organization. I was never a Muslim. Uh, just as I did not consider myself as a Christian, I had kind of gotten away from you know both of the organ all of the organized religions. Uh, I tell you very frankly, from from watching the Nation of Islam when I first saw it in 1962, when it was the most powerful-looking black organization that I had ever seen, 
and the most impressive black organization that I had ever seen. I think that on February 21st, 1965, not only was Malcolm X assassinated, but the Nation of Islam was effectively eliminated as a major force in this country. I don't think the organization has really been very much uh, since that time, at least compared to what it was before then. And your question for the critics, I'm sorry. If they foresee a change in how the uh, Academy reviews movies, and if they can give Spike Lee or any, any other uh -huh. artist awards that they deserve as a result of the work that they've accomplished. Well, actually, the Academy is made up of 5,000 highly idiosyncratic individuals, I'm afraid. And although there are certain threads that run commonly through what they do quite often, the fact of the matter is that even this year, when they ignored Malcolm X, uh, there were other films among those nominated for Best Picture that were some of the best movies of the year. Malcolm X, incidentally, although I've talked a lot about its flaws here, was on my 10 best list, for instance, because I too found it a very powerful experience. Um, so, uh, do I, I think now the Academy, uh, the average Academy voter has more of a problem with Spike Lee individually, just like they do with Steven Spielberg. Um, for different reasons, probably. And uh, he'll probably have to be old and gray before they recognize him for his body of work, which is probably what will also happen to Steven Spielberg, another popular and very visible filmmaker who doesn't seem to get any respect from the Academy, whatever they'll get, think They'll of. get Lifetime Achievement Awards. Yeah, I think, they'll, I think Spike Lee will end up with a Lifetime Achievement Award when he's about 75 years old. But, yeah, do you want to uh, add anything to that? I, I, yeah. The one thing I also think about the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is it's not exactly a, um, unpolitical itself. And I think when you look at the kinds of movies that win Academy Awards, um, they're kind of reinforcing why Hollywood is there. And I think no matter how conventional this film is, someone said earlier something about forgetting and remembering Malcolm X and that the majority of the people that are on that um, committee are not black and are you know, old enough to remember seeing Malcolm X on television, and I don't think they've forgotten that. So no matter how palatable the movie might be, I think there's still a cultural memory of Malcolm X that's not. So I think that has a lot to do with it as well. Thanks. Last question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know I'm the last speaker here, so I hope I don't monopolize uh, the rest of uh, your time. Um, good to see you again, Mr. Williams. <coughs> um, the 60s. Very, very pivotal time in American history. I wasn't even there, but uh, when I look back 28 years ago, uh, as a matter of fact, a week ago today, 28 years ago to the day of Malcolm X's assassination, it's incredible the things that have happened since then. The Kennedy murders, uh, the revelations about Hoffa and his dictatorship of the uh, FBI. It, it, it makes me think that, uh, or it, it makes me think about, about our world, our society, and, and if we're, we're capable of changing. Uh, to paraphrase Rodney King, uh, look at Malcolm X, and as a young black man, as a, a young black male student, um, I'm inspired by his fortitude, his, his integrity, maybe, maybe not in every aspect of his life, but in, in most situations, um, and how this man overcame and, uh, and made a metamorphosis. Uh, so I, I guess my question to you all uh, in sum is, um, are there any of his philosophies uh, that could be applied to uh, today's stage, uh, our world scene, our international setting? Okay, good question to close on. And the relevance of Malcolm X today, if we could uh, do that briefly, I'd appreciate it. Well, I think Juan? that, uh, in fact, a, a great deal of Malcolm X's power in the current debate comes from the idea that people look to him and say, well, how did Malcolm X deal with this as someone who, without a doubt, was in favor of making the most of black, for black people, uh, doing the best possible for black America. Because no one says, we doubt that Malcolm was really about being black. In a time when so much of uh, black identity is splintered, no one doubts it. So what would Malcolm have done? How would he have handled this situation or that? Which uh, is a very interesting issue because Malcolm was very much a man who believed strongly in family value strongly in the idea of uh, n not accepting social programs from the government, not looking to white America for redemption, but looking to the idea of black people working together, 
uh, black people building up themselves economically, educationally, their children. Uh, in all these ways, I think he offers a very strong uh, answer at a time when the issue of identity and values are in crisis in black America. Anyone else want to address that question? Christopher? Um, I think one of the reasons for the disappointment felt by audiences who've seen the film and for the, for the absence of a <clears throat> the lasting effect that some might have hoped for from it is precisely to do with the question that was just asked. In fact, where does it take you? For example, I mean, one, Williams mentioned, mentioned this, but he could, have been, he could have been, he could have extended his remarks and said, you know, family values, abstinence from alcohol and drugs, sexual continence, small business was another aspect of it. I've read countless articles in the conservative and Reaganite press in the recent months saying, why aren't more black people like Malcolm X? And these are not, all of them are trying to be funny or trying to be teasing. Indeed, they are saying, in one of my least favorite terms of the moment, as a role model, uh, McPeel might do well to emulate him. Now, if it's as easily, if his points were as easily assimilable as that, then I don't think one can count him as a revolutionary. Um, on the business of Islam, it's been proved by every society that's tried it that Islam is not a basis on which you can organize a, a society. In fact, no religion can ever organize a state or a nationality. That's been proved by Christians time and again. There are many experiments going on now of different kinds of Islam. All of them are either failing or have failed calamitously. So as far as a preacher of Islam uh, is concerned, not a success. I would, however, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, and I almost feel that uh, I have an emanation of feeling ridiculous from my, from my uh, skeptical neighbor, um, Peter Bailey. But if you ask me, what does Malcolm X mean to me? And if you can suppress your titters, I can say this much. Everywhere you look in the world at the moment, whether it might be Bosnia um, or Haiti or uh, the former Soviet Union or, the, or West Germany, now unified, Federal Republic of Germany, you can see there are always basically two kinds of people. There are those who think that the tribe into which they were born is the main thing about themselves and nothing can change that. And, the main, and if they could only like themselves more for it, congratulate themselves more about it, they would be only too happy. And there are people who realize that internationalism is not just a desirable thing, it's actually the only way the world can be organized, and in practical terms, is the only way it can be. And there are people who've had the experience of crossing that gulf. And, and, making, and Malcolm X, who had had everything that white racism could throw at him, refused to let the racists be his teachers. And that is why his example, in, in, the, in the moral and exemplary sense, is undimmed. And that, I think, would be um, an excellent way in which to remember him as, as an example of a road along which a lot of people have still got a lot of traveling to do. The Malcolm X, the Malcolm X that, that I knew and that I remember was a, was a man, and the reason that his, 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 uh, his philosophy is still strong among some black people is because they're eternal. He was about self-determination for us as a group. He was about self-respect. He was about accepting responsibility. He was about self-defense. I like those black conservatives that could ask about that. He was about self-defense. He was about internationalizing, hooking up, black people hooking up with people of African descent around the world. So he gave us a broader vision. He was about working relationships with people who, for, with, who shared mutual interests. That's what Malcolm X was about. Malcolm X uh, believed in family values. He did not believe that we should be dependent upon the government, but he also did not believe that we should not get our rightful share of government monies. As far as I am concerned, and what I learned from Brother Malcolm, there's no such thing as the United States government giving black people anything. We give this government more money in taxes every year than they give us back in goods and services, so they never give us a penny. Malcolm X would understand that, and he taught us that. Anything we get from the government, if people get welfare, that's my money they're getting back. It's not a gift from the United States government on no level, scholarship, nothing. And everybody in this country gets tax money, and we should get our rightful share. But we should not be dependent on it. But we should demand our rightful share of tax money. Malcolm X taught us that. Malcolm X talked about responsibility. There's no way you can be sniffing cocaine and talking about you believe in Malcolm X. There's no way you can be on drugs. He regarded people who did that as having basically become what the system wanted them to be. 
That's the way they got those young brothers into the na- the fruits of Islam. That's the, everybody say, how did they get those guys changed and organized? You know how they got them changed? By telling them, by doing what you are doing, you are becoming what the white man want you to be. That was the major message they gave to them over and over again to make them change. There's no mystery as to how they were able to get those guys. The same way that guy did to Brother Malcolm in prison. Nobody wants to talk about that. By doing what you're doing, Baines told him, you have become what the white man wants you to be. And that's why he changed. And, and, but we can't, we're not going to use that approach to reach the young brothers today. Because, see, that's, too, that's not universal enough. We're not going to use that kind of approach that was successful in transforming many young men and making them into more responsible young black men. But we will not use that today because that's considered not universal and that would not get you, you know, any kind of accolades. I don't except think for a single moment that the real Malcolm X is accepted by the black uh, people in this country, whether they're on the, the liberal blacks or the conservative blacks. None of them accept the real Malcolm X who was about doing things and building the power of the black community. Thank you. Stay with us for just a minute. I want to welcome everybody again to our reception on the first floor in the private dining room, first floor of Mary Graydon Center. And I want to thank our sponsors, the Xerox Foundation, the Washington Gas Light Company, and Cable Holdings. Our next forum, the last for this semester, will be in this room at 7.30 on Tuesday, April 13th. And I hope you'll join us. Those who are not on our mailing list or do not routinely receive information about the forums, there are cards available in the lobby as you leave. I want to thank the panelists for this evening, Juan Williams, Pat Dowell, Al Freeman, Jr., Jackie Jones, Peter Bailey, and Christopher Hitchens for joining us. Thank you all.